Hello, my name is Paula Perez. I am the product manager of Kamika IMS 7F02 mass spectrometer. Kamika is, as you may know, a manufacturer of magnetic sector SIMS instruments. This talk will show the results of tests performed on the IMS 7F02 for optimizing the detection limits of light elements, hydrogen, carbon, oxygen. I would like to thank the IMS 7F02 application lab team, Francois Des and Joan Choi, as well as our colleague Shiro Miwa from Kamika Japan for their contribution to this work. After an introduction to the SIMS technique and to the IMS 7F02 instrumentation, I'll focus on the light elements analysis. Results using the pre sputtering method will be presented for silicon metrics, including measurements obtained using multiple sample holders and the automated storage chamber. A brief introduction about the SIMS technique. When a solid sample is sputtered by primary ions of a few keV energy, a fraction of the particles emitted from the target is ionized. Secondary ion mass spectrometry, SIMS, consists of analyzing the secondary ions with a mass spectrometer. SIMS is a destructive technique by its nature, and it is based on sputtering of material. SIMS provides a local analysis of any type of solid flat material that can be kept under vacuum. Both elemental and isotopic information can be obtained for all species in the periodic table from hydrogen to uranium and above. Static SIMS uses very low primary ion dose and focuses on the first top monolayer, providing mostly molecular characterization. Time of flight mass spectrometers are well adapted for static SIMS analysis. Dynamic SIMS mode is based on high dose primary ion bombardment and thus provides bulk composition and in depth distribution of trace elements over depth ranges that can vary between few nanometers to tens of micrometers depending on the analytical conditions. Measurements are performed using reactive species which guarantees high sensitivity, thus low detection limits that reach the PPB level for many elements. A wide variety of analysis can be performed, depth profiles, isotope ratio analysis, ion imaging. Best performance for dynamic SIMS measurements is obtained using magnetic sector mass analyzers. A brief introduction now about the IMS 7F auto instrumentation. This sketch shows the operating mode for this type of instrument. The design of the Kamik IMS tools is based on a continuous primary ion beam bombardment as well as on a continuous secondary ion extraction, DC mode. The DC mode combined with a strong extraction field for the secondary ions collection allows to optimize the instrumental transmission and thus to achieve low detection limits. Two primary ion sources are available, cesium for the analysis of electronegative species and oxygen for analyzing electropositive species. The secondary ions, which are characteristic of the composition of the analyzed area, are collected and then separated in a magnetic sector analyzer according to their mass. The Kanika double focusing mass spectrometer design is based on the coupling of the magnetic sector with an electrostatic sector for efficient mass separation. These instruments work in monocollection mode, secondary ions being acquired one by one by scanning the magnetic field. Two detectors are available, one electromultiplier for lower count rates and one Faraday cup for higher count rates. The IMS 7F Auto combines the field-proven instrumental advantages of the IMS 7F with additional developments towards improved automation and operation efficiency. The IMS 7F Auto is equipped with a redesigned inline primary column, allowing easier operation and faster primary beam tuning. A source chamber allows simultaneous mounting of both the dual plasmatron which is the oxygen source, 
and the cesium microbeam ion source. The dual plasma drone source is mounted at the top in line with the primary ion column. It includes a VIN filter for removal of parasitic species. The cesium microbeam source is retractable. It moves between the parking position when not used for analysis and the working position in line with the primary column. A motorized automated storage chamber is also available. Two options are available for the sample introduction system. The instrument can be equipped with a manual airlock with two sample holder positions and a vacuum. The sample transfer between the airlock and the analysis chamber is manual. Or it can be equipped with an automated storage chamber allowing to keep up to six sample holders and a vacuum. Note that each holder contains four small samples typically. The holders are manually introduced one by one in the storage chamber using a small load lock. The holder exchange between the storage chamber and the analysis chamber is fully motorized and computer controlled. We can see here the photos of the automated storage chamber. It includes a motorized transfer rod for automated load and load of sample holders as well as a computer-controlled sample get the gassing system using a halogen bulb. Also shown is the small, fast load lock for introducing a holder inside the storage chamber. This automated storage chamber provides significantly higher throughput as multiple samples from different holders can be analyzed in fully unattended and automated mode. It is particularly useful for applications requiring good vacuum quality, such as light elements analysis. After overnight outgassing in the storage chamber, it is possible to analyze a large number of samples the day after, increasing the instrument productivity. The storage chamber is kept under vacuum, thus maintaining long-term UHV conditions. It is also very useful for keeping the reference samples under vacuum. Combined with automated routines for precise centering of the secondary beam, excellent short and long-term reproducibility can be achieved on different windows of a given holder and or multiple sample holders. I will now focus on the light elements application. Analysis of atmospheric species, hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, is known to be challenging. During the analysis of light elements, and more specifically of residual gas species like H, C, N, O, detection limits are affected by the background level due to residual gases in the UHV specimen chamber of the SIMS instrument. It is also known that the background levels depend on the sticking coefficient between the residual gas species and the matrix materials. For instance, the oxygen detection limit degrades as the matrix aluminum content increases because of the increasing sticking coefficient between H2O and the matrix. The INS7F auto provides good, meaning low, detection limits for light elements thanks to use of a continuous primary beam bombardment, which reduces the contamination compared to alternated dual beam load, high-density cesium primary ion beam for reaching high sputtering rates that significantly improve the detection limits. Improving the vacuum inside the instrument also leads to a better detection limit. The 7F auto is equipped with a UHV analysis chamber with optimized vacuum conditions and equipped with a liquid nitrogen trap to lower the partial pressure of water vapor. It also includes a fully automated six-holder storage chamber with holder baking capabilities as discussed previously. Dynamic seams provide superior performance when compared to other techniques. GDMS, Glow Discharge Mass Spectrometry, simply cannot be used to measure the HCO composition because of high background signal limitations. Soft seams can analyze light elements 
but with poorer detection limits due to its lower acquisition speed, contamination issues resulting from its intrinsic pulsed ion beam design, and poorer vacuum level in the analysis chamber. As mentioned before, measurements at high sputtering rates using high impact energy and high primary current are employed to obtain a better detection limit. However, in practice, high sputter rates cannot be used for measuring light elements in epitaxial thin films or when the depth of interest is shallow. How to improve the detection limits other than by increasing the sputter rate? I will present now the pre-sputtering method. This method, based on long primary ion bombardment prior to analysis, that we will call pre-sputtering, has been proposed some time ago for improving the detection limit of light elements. In the Chemica IMS 7F Auto, the first lens after the sample is called the immersion lens. The distance between the sample surface and the cover plate of the immersion lens is around 5 mm. For analysis of light elements, the sample is put at negative voltage, typically minus 5 kV, whereas the front plate of the immersion lens is at Earth's potential. To be noted that on the top of the sample, there is always a contaminated oxidized layer. During long pre-sputtering, there is emission of secondary ions from the sample, negative ions in this case. Some of these ions impinge the immersion lens front plate, so its surface is sputtered by secondary ions from the sample. The sample surface is also sputtered by the secondary ions emitted from the front plate and that have opposite charge to the sample potential. In addition, neutral species are deposited both on the sample surface and on the front plate surface. The deposited neutral species form a clean surface, somehow like a clean coating. A clean sample surface decreases the background emission of hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen secondary ions generated by primary ions and neutrons. This method was tested on silicon-based samples. Measurements of light elements were performed on a silicon reference sample implanted with hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen. Analysis were performed on the 7F auto using usual conditions, cesium-15 keV impact energy and negative ion detection. The pressure in the analysis chamber was around 3 E-10 millibar and the liquid nitrogen trap was used. Note that the analysis chamber of the 7F auto is equipped with a Pfeiffer turbo pump with 700 liters per second pumping speed. Different sputtering rate conditions were tested around 18, 6 and 2 nanometer per second that we will call high, medium and low sputter rate. Measurement protocol was based on long pre-sputtering around 20 hours. The evening before the sample was loaded in a sample holder, the holder was introduced in the multi-storage chamber and was baked out during 30 minutes at high temperature. The sample holder was then transferred into the analysis chamber. Overnight, a silicon sample was pre-sputtered in the analysis chamber using high current and large raster. The next day in the morning, liquid nitrogen was introduced in the cold trap while pre-sputtering. After three, four hours, the pre-sputtering was stopped and analysis was started. We can see here the results obtained at high sputter rate. A detection limit around 1 in 16 could be achieved for hydrogen and oxygen, and the detection limit around 3 in 15 was obtained for carbon. At medium sputter rate, the detection limits only slightly increase. At lower sputter rate, a detection limit be below 3 in 16 is obtained for hydrogen and oxygen, and around 5 in 15 for carbon. 
These results show that excellent detection limits could be achieved, and this even for lower sputtering rate conditions. We compare here the champion data obtained with pre-sputtering against the standard data obtained without pre-sputtering for hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen. Data show that there is a significant improvement of detection limits with pre-sputtering protocol independently of the sputter rate, and in particular for hydrogen and carbon. The effect is less pronounced for oxygen. Note that the measurement protocol for standard data without pre-sputtering includes sample baking and outgassing in the storage chamber overnight, sample introduction in the analysis chamber, and liquid nitrogen introduction in the morning. Measurements are started 90 minutes after sample transfer to the analysis chamber. I will show now measurements of light elements performed on multiple samples and holders using the pre-sputtering method. Analysis were performed using similar conditions as before. Pressure in the analysis chamber was in the low E-10 millibar, and liquid nitrogen trap was used. All measurements have been performed using medium sputter rate conditions around 6 nanometer per minute. Measurements were performed on four float zone silicon samples loaded each into a different holder. A reference sample was also introduced in holder one for performing data quantification. On the evening before, the four sample holders, one, four, five, and six, were taken out of the instrument to the atmosphere during 10 minutes in order to start from the same initial conditions for all holders. The holders were then introduced in the multi-storage chamber one by one. Holder one was baked out in the multi-storage chamber during 30 minutes at high temperature, and then was loaded into the analysis chamber. Overnight, sample holder one remained in the analysis chamber a long pre-sputtering of a silicon sample was performed using high current and large raster. The three other sample holders, four, five, six, were kept in the storage chamber. They were baked out during six hours each using an automated baking routine. The day after, in the morning, liquid nitrogen was introduced in the cold trap and then we waited three, four hours while continuing pre-sputtering. In the beginning of the afternoon, pre-sputtering was stopped and analysis were performed on sample holder one, both on the reference sample and on the float zone sample. After this first set of measurements, holder one was unloaded to the multi-storage chamber. Then an automated chain analysis sequence has been started on the four sample holders, one again, then four, five, and six. Three runs were performed on each sample. Analysis was started 90 minutes after loading a holder into the analysis chamber. Here are the results obtained for hydrogen. The best results are obtained for float zone one, in the holder that stayed in the analysis chamber overnight. For float zone one, no difference is observed between the two sets of measurements. I recall that the second set of measurements was performed after unloading to the storage chamber and then loading back to the analysis chamber. Similar results were obtained for float zone five and six, the detection limit is about three times higher than for float zone one. For a reason that is not clear, a higher detection limit was obtained for float zone four. For carbon. As for hydrogen, the best results were obtained on float zone one in the holder that stayed in the analysis chamber overnight. Again, no difference is observed for float zone one for the two sets of measurements. Similar results were obtained for float zone four, five, and six. As for hydrogen, the detection limit is about three times higher than for float zone one. For oxygen now. Again, the best results were obtained for float zone one. 
And again, no difference is observed after holder one is unloaded and then loaded back to the analysis chamber. The results obtained for float zone four, five, and six show some variability. The detection limit is about 20 to 50% higher than for float zone one, depending on the holder. If we summarize, measurements were performed using optimized vacuum conditions, liquid nitrogen, and with a medium sputter rate around six nanometer per second. Holder one was kept in an analysis chamber overnight, and long pre-sputtering was performed on one silicon sample in this holder. Holders four, five, six were kept in the storage chamber overnight and were outgassed using an automated baking routine. There was a first set of analysis performed on float zone one, then automated chain analysis were run on the four samples, one, four, five, and six, each in a different holder. The champion data, best detection limits, are obtained on the sample that remained in the analysis chamber overnight. This is probably because during pre-sputtering, a clean layer is deposited on the surface of that particular holder. The detection limits were similar for the samples in the three holders that stayed in the storage chamber, float zone four, five, and six, except for one data set that was excluded. For those holders, the detection limit for hydrogen and carbon was about three times higher than for float zone one. For oxygen, the effect was less pronounced in average, the detection limit was about 40% higher than for float zone one. So if the very best detection limits are required, one needs to perform the pre-sputtering on a silicon sample, any sample, which is in the same holder as the samples of interest. For optimized throughput, multiple samples, holders, can be outcast in the storage chamber overnight for unattended automated analysis the day after. Though the detection limits are higher, they are still quite good. 4 is 16 for hydrogen, 1 is 16 for carbon, 3 is 16 for oxygen. Additional observations using similar vacuum configuration and conditions. The champion data could not be obtained after overnight pre-sputtering when using lower primary current, around 200 nanoamps, instead of one microamp. So it seems that the high current is needed. Champion data for carbon detection limits using high sputtering rates could be obtained after only four hours pre-sputtering and using high current. Further investigation is required in order to verify these observations and in order to establish the optimized pre-sputtering protocol. I would like now to conclude this talk. It is important to control hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen impurities, the so-called atmospheric gas elements, as they are known to affect device performance and lifetime. Dynamic seams plays an important role in evaluating the concentration of impurities in different types of materials because of its high sensitivity, depth profiling capabilities with high depth resolution, high throughput, and good detection limits. Based on the dynamic SIMS technique, the IMS7F Auto is designed to achieve excellent detection limits on light element measurements thanks to continuous ion beam sputtering and magnetic sector mass spectrometer design, high density cesium primary ion beam allowing high sputtering rates that significantly improve the detection limits, UHV analysis chamber with optimized vacuum conditions and liquid nitrogen trap, minimizing the background level due to residual gases, and fully automated six-holder storage chamber with sample outgassing capabilities for higher throughput. Data in this talk show that significant improvement of detection limits in silicon could be achieved using the pre-sputtering method, in particular for hydrogen and carbon. Further investigation is required in order to optimize the pre-sputtering protocol. To finish, I would like to thank again my co-authors, 
the application lab team in France and Japan. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact me at this email address. Thank you so much for your attention.